I haven't started any mass movements. I don't have a mass movement to start, but I can speak from experience. I'll be talking with you today about a framework for understanding things that create addictive behaviors. And it's not my academic credentials that qualify me to share this with you. It's my experience, my personal experience as an addict. And I'm coming clean today, telling this story for the very first time in its raw, ugly detail. In March of 2012, winter was ending, or so I thought, and the winter of my discontent was beginning when I purchased a device that would slowly begin to ruin my life. And <laughs> my husband is right here, and he's smiling because he lived through this with me. The device that I purchased was a pedometer. You're thinking, pedometer? But some of you are thinking, I have that pedometer. This wasn't just any pedometer. This was the Strive. They market it as personal trainer in your pocket. No, it is Satan in your pocket, <laughs> tempting you and tempting you to walk and tempting you to walk. So you know how you're supposed to reach 10,000 steps a day as an ideal goal for living a healthy life and being a healthy person? How many of you have tried and measured, tried to reach 10,000 steps a day? It's hard, <laughs> right? This is not trivial. 10,000 steps is five miles. <coughs> when I was using the Strive, I was going 24,000 steps a day. You do the math. I'm not a distance runner. And if you're walking, the only way that you can reach 10,000 steps a day is by not stopping. So that's what I did. I would arrive at work, I would grab an article, anything that I didn't need to be at the computer to do, and I would pace down the corridor outside my office. I would come home, and while I was eating, or while I was reading, or while I was eating and reading at the same time, or while my husband was trying to talk to me, I would be going in the circuit between the living room and the kitchen and the dining room, and the living room and the kitchen and the dining room, my marriage was deteriorating. I spent a little more time with my daughter. She was three at the time. And I only spent time with her because she was willing to sit down with me on my lap and fool with the freaking pedometer <laughs> with me. <laughs> so the only people that I was getting closer to at this point in time were my colleague Ernest, who also had a strive, so we could set challenges and we could compete with each other and we could bond over it. And with a community of freaks on the internet <laughs> <laughs> who were addicts like me. I was creating spreadsheets to optimize and track not my exercising, but my virtual transactions in a virtual world that existed on a Strive device. You know the game Farmville? It's that really boring, boring game where nothing happens, but it's so addictive that it helped cause the US economic collapse. <laughs> right? Those developers developed a game inside Strive. It's called My Land. Nothing happens except that plants grow and buildings get built and nothing happens. But this game is so addictive that you just can't stop. The I guess I would say the last straw was one night, it was midnight, and I was brushing my teeth, I was getting ready for bed, and on the Strive, this pop-up challenge showed up. And these things surprise you, you don't know when they're gonna happen. This pop-up challenge comes, and it says, we'll give you triple the points if you just climb 20 stairs. And that's not a lot. Two flights of stairs, you can do it probably in a minute. So no problem, I go down to the basement, climb 20 sets, of I don't have two flights of stairs in my basement, but you know, up and down like a treadmill, and then, but I finish it, and then another challenge pops up, and it says, hey, great, how about 40 steps, and we'll triple the points again, and these are the points you can use in that crazy virtual world, so yes, of course, it's a good deal, it's a good exchange rate. Four more <laughs> flights of stairs, I'm a behavioral economist, apparently, so four more flights of stairs, and there are more challenges, and even without the challenges, I find that I can't stop, and between midnight and two o'clock in the morning, two hours that I had planned on sleeping, I am going, like a nutcase, up and down the stairs in my basement, 2,000 stairs I climb. I hurt my neck. My neck is injured because my head, my stupid head is bouncing up and down like this, <laughs> right? And at this time, I had become so neurotic 
that I was spending hours a day counting my steps, and I found that even when I wasn't moving, I was still counting. The blessing of the stairs episode was the neck injury. When the neck injury happened, I had to take a break from exercising, which allowed me to take a break from the strive, and I finally acknowledged what my husband had been saying for a while, that I had a problem. <laughs> I would have gone to a 12-step program, but that would have seemed like another challenge. <laughs> <laughs> so the only option was to go cold turkey. And at this point, I thought it was my problem. So I gave this drive to my sister. She lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and we talk on the phone, and we're communicating with each other. She loves it. She's so happy. It was a wonderful present. And I do notice that many of the times that we talk to each other, she's walking around outside. It seems like a good thing until my mom calls me and she tells me that my sister Mika has been walking around outside in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which many of you know is an urban area in the middle of the night and she's walking for miles. She's taking her life into her own hands when she does this. You guys know there aren't any street walkers in Cambridge, it's mostly college kids, but it is urban, and the only women who are walking around at night for miles are crazy. <laughs> and she's crazy. She's possessed by Satan in her pocket. <laughs> I found out recently how many times the average Strive user checks their device. And I'm just curious, do you have a pedometer? Have you had one? No. If you had one, how many times do you think you might check it in a day or a week? Probably every uh, five minutes. Every five minutes. So you would be like me. You would be totally insane. And what I learned is that despite being totally insane, we're not alone. The average Strive user, the average one, not the crazy one, checks their device 29 times a day. What is it about this machine? that makes it so compelling? What is it that's so tempting? What I want to share with you is a framework that is the six human needs. And this is a framework that was shared first with me by Tony Robbins, who's pulled these needs together. But it's based on solid motivational research in each of these areas. And Tony Robbins' claim is that any behavior that meets at least three of these six needs is going to become an addiction if it meets those needs in a powerful way. I'm a scientist, and this is the kind of claim that can't be empirically validated, so I can't go out and test it. But you can test it in your own life and see if this works for you. The first of the human needs, I'll share how each of these fits with Strive as we go through. The first, of the first human need is for significance. And this is the desire to feel that we are important, that we matter. It's the ego. This is one of the key drivers for human life, human behavior. And in the Strive machine, as I've shared with you already, first of all, you're completing challenges. So you feel powerful. You're kicking ass. And also, you have this virtual word, world where you're playing God. It's the Garden of Eden. And the whole world depends on you. It's powerfully significant. There's also certainty. This is another key driver of human behavior. And the need for certainty is wrapped up in the need for security. All species have the need to feel safe and secure. And we want to know that our expectations about the world are likely to be met at least much of the time. In the Strive device, you have certainty that when you take one step, you will get one point if you're walking. If you're going upstairs, you get three. If you're running, you get five. You know when you wake up in the morning that when you climb 374 stairs, you will get an award called the Statue of Liberty, and you know what the little picture is going to look like. <laughs> Paradoxically, the third human need is uncertainty. And this is our need for a sense of variety and surprise and spice in life. If you're a rat and you get food pellets by pressing a lever, when it's unpredictable how much and when you'll get food, you're going to press that lever like crazy. This is also why we buy lottery tickets. We know that it's stupid, but sometimes we win and we don't know when and we don't know how much we're going to win. And with Strive, as I was sharing with you, there are these unpredictable little pop-up challenges that are so tempting you just can't possibly resist. 
The fourth human need is our need for connection. And this is the need that ensures our survival as a species. It's what allows us and encourages us and even forces us to form social groups. It's how we make babies. It's why we take care of our babies. And I told you that when I was using this drive, my family life was falling apart, but I was feeling connected to these other crazy people. I was feeling connected to my friend Ernest. It's maybe <coughs> like a druggie who feels connected to their dealer. The final human need is the need for growth. This is the need to feel that we're moving forward, that we're becoming something. Research on motivation in organizations finds that the most powerful predictor of employee engagement is a sense of progress. That whatever job you're doing, if you feel like you're making progress from day to day, you're going to be excited about your job. And when you have a pedometer, even if it's not a cool one like Strive, you see the numbers <laughs> flipping as you're walking, right? And uh, this Strive also has adaptive benchmarks. So you start out getting prizes at 10,000 steps, but then when you beat your records, it goes up to 24,000. There's a lot of growth you can experience, and you're also experiencing growth and changes in your physical body, most of them being good, maybe not all of them so much. With this framework of six human needs, I think this is a plausible explanation for why a device like Strive can be so addictive. And I think it's also possible that we could predict which behaviors would spread and which behaviors would not. Let's take an, a different example, leaving the Strive behind. Let's take flash mobs. So a flash mob is from all appearances kind of like a spontaneously generated mass movement, right? A flash mob is a group of people who organize on the internet, convene at a particular location, do something bizarre and usually pointless, and then disperse. To me, in theory, that doesn't sound like an idea worth spreading. But in practice, it did. It spread like wildfire. The first flash mob happened in February 2003, and by 2004, flash mob was in the o Oxford English Dictionary. At this point, the American Bar Association, which is not the vanguard of cool, they have a whole page on their website dedicated to flash mob law. <laughs> and the first flash mob was completely lame, I think. 200 people convened in a department store to look at a particular rug and say they were trying to buy a love rug for their group apartment. But they got cooler. So you've seen them on the internet. If you haven't participated in one, there's lots of singing and dancing, synchronized movement, zombie races. Who doesn't love that? The pillow fights with 5,000 people. In Grand Central Station, you'll have 200 people walking around, going about their business, and then all of a sudden, all of them freeze for five seconds, and then go about their business as if nothing happened. Flash mobs are spreading all across the world. Videos are going viral. At this point, I think it's kind of disturbing and wrong for some reason, but you can even hire a company to put on a flash mob for you. <laughs> so what is it about flash mobs that m has made them go viral? And looking at the six human needs again, let's think about it. So need for significance. You're the center of attention. And we're taking the perspective of the flash mobber, which is another term in the dictionary. You're meeting your need for significance because you get to be the center of attention. Everybody's looking at you. And you're creating an experience that they're going to remember, and maybe other people are going to relive this experience and even watch you online. You're meeting a need for certainty, interestingly, because even though you're doing something pretty weird, you're doing it in a group. A flash mob performance is an ensemble piece, and there's no individual judgment of you as a person. So you can still feel safe and secure. You're meeting your need for uncertainty because, as we said, variety, it's the spice of life. You're doing something completely different, but also this is a theatrical performance with no dress rehearsal, no tech rehearsal, and no guarantee of what's going to happen when you get there. You're meeting your need for connection because group activities, and especially synchronized movements, they create rapport. So when you're 
coming together in a flash mob with other people. As it, it's as if you become this group entity. And you can also be meeting your need for growth if you are a person who values, as part of your development, being someone who does things that are fun and interesting and spontaneous. You're creating stories that you can share, potentially even with your grandchildren. So flash mobs from this perspective, not so crazy that it became so popular, right? Let's think about something else that's much more obvious that it would be a good thing. Wearing a motorcycle helmet when you ride your motorcycle. No downside, obviously it's a good idea, right? But look at these needs and which one of them is it meeting? Only certainty, which is the need for security, right? There's nothing else that the motorcycle helmet is meeting. And if you think about it, certainty and security is not the need you're trying to meet when you're riding a motorcycle, right? <laughs> so not a contagious behavior, and this is why we have to regulate it. My challenge to you, as you leave here, and as you think about these talks that you've seen here today, is that you consider taking this framework and using this as a way that you could develop your own habit, or you could make your behavior that you care about, more addictive, help your ideas spread. I would love to hear about it. Thank you so much for listening. And I hope that you will go forth from here and prosper and succeed as you spread awesomeness around the globe. <laughs>